Um, welcome everybody to um, this session this morning with Caroline Oswald from StreamGo. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to turn your events virtual. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hello everyone um, and thanks for attending the event. Um, my name's Caroline, obviously I've been beautifully introduced there. Um, I'm Head of Business Development at StreamGo and as you can imagine the change in volume of the conversations I'm having about virtual events in the last three, four weeks has um, been considerable. So um, the number of questions I've had, uh, the scenarios that we've mapped out, the types of virtual events that we've, we're building um, is expanding by the minute. Um, StreamGo is a business. We are an online events company, so we run everything from uh, managed podcasts, webinars, webcasts, virtual events and um, going out filming and, and full production live streaming for our clients. Um, to talk about what a virtual event is, I think it's important to sort of define it. Um, you know, typically it's a large online event. It involves interactivity. Um, it typically has multiple keynotes and breakout sessions, sponsor led sessions and booths. Um, and the type of content that can be on these sessions is, uh, is totally variable. Now that's probably the, the biggest and widest definition. Uh, I have conversations with clients that want a single session uh, and just one sponsor booth and one breakout area. Um, and then I have <laughs> sort of conversations with clients that have uh, 45 speakers, 45 breakout rooms and um, a huge conference that they want to, to put online. So there's a, a vast array of types or styles that we can um, look at and address and focus on. Um, but if we start with the sort of fundamentals or the, the most frequently asked questions answered, first of all, um, there's obviously some really bizarre ones coming through to me at the moment. Um, I'm gonna stick with the, the traditional to start with. Uh, so first of all, really consider what your virtual event looks like. It's really easy to you know, look at the platforms out there and go, do you know what? I'm just gonna chuck the sessions on any platform that I can find that's the cheapest or um, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna put a video on my webpage. Think about how your brand is represented at a physical conference. Are you a brand that turns up with one uh, you know, roller banner and one person, a tablecloth and a table and a couple of leaflets? Or are you a brand that shows up with uh, you know, an extraordinarily expensive stand, all the bells and whistles in the world? Um, consider that for your virtual event as well. You, know, you might actually be able to afford more bells and whistles on a virtual event than you can in a real event but make sure it represents your brand. Don't just um, you know, go for a, there's lots of 1990s looking virtual events out there at the moment. And is that representative of the style, of the voice, of the tone of voice, of the, of the visuals and design, of your website, of your brand, of does it talk to your audience? Uh, that's first of all, a ma massive thing um, for, for sort of clients and um, for, for best practice really. Uh, the second one is condense your content. So, <laughs> you know, I've just mentioned 45 speakers, 45 breakout rooms. Um, start thinking creatively because if you think about how long you would be happy to sit and consume content for, would you sit for eight hours for three days and consume that content? ask yourself the question, is that content really valuable? You know, is it CPD driven? Is it um, something that is completely exclusive and people can't get anywhere else? Even your the best TV program, you might be able to binge watch a box set, but you know, consider the content, how fascinating is it? I'd advise to condense because realistically, people are only really, even if they are, furloughed and they're quiet at the moment. Um, three hours, four hours of content realistically across a day um, is probably best practice. Otherwise, you're not going to get it in people's diaries. They're going to miss sessions that um, they really wanted to see and you're going to lose engagement. When we're advising clients about timings on 
uh, webinars or webcasts, for example, certainly from a webinar, if you've only got slide and audio, um, the chances of be people being completely engaged with that for longer than 39 minutes, which is the sweet spot, <laughs> is unlikely. Um, so if you had no interactivity, slides and audio, but you still had great content, you're not going to get much more than 39 minutes out of people. So when you're thinking about your content, think about different types of content. And we'll go on to that a bit um, in, in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, make it fun. Um, so everyone's uh, not their most bubbly and excited at the moment. Um, and even when they're not, that kind of different type of content in there um, and making it fun as you know I've got the biggest most serious clients um, in the world putting games into their virtual events you know snake um, integrating a third party game app there's lots of different ways you can approach it or make a competition out of it give something away um, at the end of, of your event maybe link it to the engagement of people so the most engaged top three most engaged people on your virtual event get a prize then you're sort of driving that competitive spirit across your event i've got some clients having entrance music for hosts i've got you know um people doing wellness sessions over the break um you know you might have three or four hours of solid content, um, but then you've still got a lunch hour. What are you going to do in the lunch hour? And it might be, might be a, a workout with Joe Wicks. You never know. Um, mix it up. So what I mean here is I've probably, it's probably going to be one of the key themes across what I talk about today. Um, don't just do slides and audio. Um, like I say, you'll have 39 minutes max of people's engagement. Think differently about how you're going to present your content. One of the, the or some of the best virtual events I've seen over the years are those where you've got a common host. So the same thing that you do at a real event, you've got a common host that jumps up onto the stage at the beginning of the event. They welcome everyone. They introduce every keynote. They've got loads about them. They're absolutely not monotone. <laughs> They've got loads of personality. Um, and think about video content. Think about not just kind of webcams like we're doing right now, not just um, like a video snippet in your PowerPoint. Think about putting promotional videos on um, in and around as content on your virtual event. Uh, think about playing um, videos or something fun in breaks um, think about all the different types of video content you probably already have as a brand you know uh, there's so much video content consumed by the public whether it be to b or b to c uh, every day you know the chances of you not having any video content would be fairly slim i think so think about reusing that think about how you can look at different types of content so we as people consume content in different ways i'm a very very visual person other people might like reading um quite often you've got people who are you know super busy but they could probably listen to a podcast session mix it up have a bit of everything on your virtual event so you're catering for all different types of learners and different types of um, consumers and you're also making it um, a bit dynamic in the sense of it's not just slides and audio. Um, in different times, um, get a professional film career and um, live stream your live conference as well. Um, get yourself a wider audience and a more global audience potentially. Call for backup. What do I mean by this? So um, if you've got a, a virtual event, Think about your, your real life event. If you had a decent sized conference, would you try and do it all yourself? <laughs> Probably not. Um, would you try and do the lighting, the filming, all of the tech, back up the analytics? Would you try and do all of that yourself in a, in a real conference? Um, I, I question if you are doing that, you're a hero. Um, 
but the same applies to a virtual event. Don't try and do it all yourself. If you've got, you know, a multi-track event um, with many, many speakers, you've got enough on your plate, making sure that they turn up, making sure that their content's ready, making sure that, um, you know, they're, they're ready to go and you've got an audience there. You know, even marketing the event is, is a challenge. So consider using a managed platform or asking for a consultant to assist you in creating um, a really slick uh, virtual event. And the other thing is, you know, there are some wonderful, wonderful free tools out there, you know, and they are, you know, coming to the fore at the moment um, as everyone's uh, not leaving the house. But consider how sturdy they are, consider how secure they are, and consider how um, professional they look. And by that, I mean, security is super important. You know, there's been some Zoom bombing going on. There's been um, people jumping into meetings. Um, how accessible is, is your conference? And if you've got, um, you know, some um, highbrow keynote speakers there, um, how confident are they going to be about their content being shared wide and far? Um, if you've got sensitive content, make sure you can lock that event down. The other bit is... If you're using one of the, the free tools and some of the software out there that is great and inexpensive, challenge them, ask them what the backup plan is. What happens if my event goes down? What happens if my speaker loses Wi-Fi? What happens if your whole app crashes? Because in my experience, the answer is you've got email support and you've got... Um, it, you, you're probably not going to get your virtual event back up that day. So think about the stability of your event, the solution that you're choosing. And, you know, um, this is not me on a sales pitch. Think, ask, ask the questions, really test your supplier. Do you have a backup content delivery network? Do you have redundancy issues if, or plans, if uh, contingency plans, if it does go down or if something does happen? And if they don't, consider the impact on your brand, your sponsor's brand and your speakers if it does go down um, and, and really question that. Um, be interactive. I think we've, we've talked about interactivity even on this event. You know, there's, there's, less value in delivering an event that just talks at people. So try and give them the opportunity to talk back. And there's lots of different ways you can do it. You know, today we're using Zoom, we're going to raise hands, we're going to interact by chat. But consider the types of things that you can do. So um, obviously live chat is, is kind of probably the most um, common. So <clears throat> in our business, we offer lots of variations on live chat so let me just try and talk you through them without causing horrible confusion because there's hundreds of options but one-to-one -one chat give your delegates the opportunity to network one-to-one -one in a private um, chat that isn't monitored in the same way that they bump into each other in, in a real conference give them that opportunity to to mix and mingle um, with a peer-to-peer -peer chat on a one-to-one -one basis um, with that, uh, you know, you could basically toggle it on and toggle it off depending on what time of the day it is in your sessions. You don't necessarily want it live during your keynotes because at the end of the day, people are going to get into wonderful chats and they'll just not show up to your keynotes. Um, so think about when as well, when you have chat available, when you have sponsor booths available um, and what type you have available. Um, Having sponsor one-to-one -one chat is obviously um, a, a value add for your sponsor. They're getting to speak directly to their potential engaged audience um, and driving potential leads through their, um, their funnel. The video chat, um, having private rooms where people can break out. If, you know, if you've got a, a one-to-many or a few-to-many um, chat within sponsor booths, specialist rooms, um, even I'd suggest breaking out your chats for every keynote so that it's specific to that subject matter. Um, but give the opportunity for people to break out into private chats because that's where you're going to get some really high value return. And that can be video. It could be just, just chat based. Um, 
the other bit is obviously looking at third party apps. So um, any system worth their salt, or if you've got a really smart tech team that can build you an environment very quickly, then ask them to look at, at these apps and, you know, good virtual event um, solutions will have their own system built in, but you might have a collection of delegates that are used to coming to your physical events and they're used to using Slido and you don't really want to change that because it's part of, of your brand events. Um, so think about those, uh, think about sort of fun um, interactivity. So there's quite a few out there that are allowing, it's, it's like a, a speed dating or um, matchmaking style networking session and <laughs> not with the dating at the end, but it gives the opportunity for people to be randomly matched with, uh, with others. Um, that gives a bit of interest in those virtual coffee mornings and things like that. And then I've already mentioned it, but gamification, it doesn't have to be um, a silly game. You know, if you've got the budget and you've got um, access to um, games developers, a, lo a lot of them will be um, kind of very quietly working at the moment. So they might have a bit more spare time, um, you know, just to build you a simple game that is completely branded for your brand. And there's lots of companies out there that do that. Um, alternatively, your supplier might be able to do it. Um, the other thing is try and make sure that everything is available and adaptable for mobile. Because, you know, it might be iPads, it might be mobile phones. Somebody might be working with their iPad propped up beside their screen watching, um, watching something. Whereas in the office, quite often people have more than one screen. They might not have that at home. That luxury might have disappeared. Um, so consider every option in terms of the type of device people will be watching on. And um, breakout. So, you know, it doesn't happen in every virtual, in every real event, uh, but it is very common. Uh, whether you have a breakout session as a workshop, whether you have breakout round tables, whatever it might look like, you can replicate that in a virtual event. And what you can do is you can have those virtual round tables as video conferences, um, and then feed that information back into the next keynote, or they can be related to each keynote. Um, you could do a breakout, breakout workshops, depending on, you know, the interest of parts of your audience. And it's all about creating multiple rooms. So in the same way as you'd have breakout rooms or workshop rooms um, at, a, at a live conference, that can be created in a, in a virtual way as well. And giving people the opportunity to have that round table and talk it out and talk about their interest in that um, particular session that they've just watched. It's quite a nice way of that networking piece to come back in um, and that peer-to-peer -peer sort of knowledge share. <coughs> Excuse me. Make sure your decisions add value. Um, what do I mean by this? So when your sponsors book with you to run an event, a live event with you, they want a nice shiny sponsor booth. They want data. They want um, foot flow. Um, across their sponsor booth and they want the right people in front of them. The other thing is there are so many ways you can deliver your virtual event, but consider how much value each decision you make um, is adding to your event. So for example, um, you can build live events that are like uh, real entrance lobbies. You go into real rooms, there's chairs, there's, you know, it can go right up to avatars of people walking around, or you can have quite a fresh, modern um, sort of web page based event. There are lots of sort of pieces in between, but if we look at these two as an example, um, if you're going to be 3D rendering imagery and you're going to be creating avatars, you're looking at a much higher budget than if you're going to do a web page based event. So ask yourself, what value is that adding to my event? Because quite frankly, we don't know how many, how long we're going to be virtual. We don't know how many of the events this year are going to be pushed to virtual. Um, so if you could perhaps create um, more 
simple looking events is that more valuable to your brand than one absolutely you know high budget high end incredibly interactive 3d rendered um super exciting event and i can't answer those questions for you that's for you to decide um and again going right back to the beginning right back to that first thing that i mentioned does it represent your brand um sponsor boots what's the value for a sponsor um, it's one of the biggest questions I get asked. They're like, okay, my sponsors are like, I totally get the, um, uh, the, the value that I get at a, at a physical event, but I'm not sold on, on virtual. Well, it's how you really deliver it and what you give them. You, we, you know, as, a, as a company, we can brand everything up to the hilt. We can you know, design virtual sponsor booths with live chat, live video chat. Um, you know, they can deliver sessions. but frequently it's the analytics the engagement and the data that your sponsors see the most value in um, so make sure whichever platform you might deliver your virtual event on gives you that opportunity and obviously make sure that at the registration gate that you opt people in um, or they get the opportunity to opt in to speak to sponsors um, so that you've got your gdpr hat covered Um, the other bit that you know we manage is things like giving sponsors the opportunity to book one-to-one -one meetings or giving people delegates the opportunity to book a one-to-one -to -one meeting with a sponsor or a specialist or a subject matter expert um, obviously live chat and request a call back or book a demo call to actions um, within any of the rooms or with any of the sessions um, you know consider an additional value add for your sponsor what's going to help them get to a sale or um, a deeper engagement with the delegates that are on your event um, i mentioned that all bells and whistles 3d rendered avatar floating um, event and here i've got an example that we're um, currently building for a client where literally everything is 3d rendered you can sort of walk 360 around every room. You can practically go up the escalators and um, you've got a welcome speech there. You can navigate with the, the nav bar or there's hotspots where you can float to across the room. And um, even the virtual conference room, you can sit at any seat. Um, so this is kind of probably the highest budget, the highest end virtual event that you could um, possibly consider. Um, and you know you can see on the left hand side the nav bar you've got a uh, lobby the theater's got you know all the chairs and and the keynote stage um meetings have got individual meeting rooms all glass walled very beautiful um their exhibition is quite interesting because um when you have 3d uh, 3d products so if you've got a product to sell and you're thinking, oh, right, do you know what? Usually people are a bit hands-on with it at a, virtual, at, a, at a real event, at a physical event. You know, they wanna pick it up and hold it or they wanna look at it 360. Then that tends to add quite a lot of value. So our retail clients, you know, if they're trying to project what they do to um, their wholesalers, for example, doing 360 imagery of your products adds a lot of value. Um, physical gifts make an impact. So I've seen so many amazing ones recently. Um, it can be as simple as sending your delegates a bar of chocolate, uh, a tea bag and a, um, a biscuit um, for the, the event that they're going to join. Or it can be as complex. I've seen the most amazing um, supper club event recently where they, you know, it's fairly expensive, but they sent everyone um, sort of a almost, I don't want to sell any particular brand here, but I'm just thinking of off the top of my head, like a gusto box um, with all of the, all of those sort of ready-made meals in, in there, a three course meal, a little bottle of wine, and it's literally like your dinner party and everybody opens the box at the same time and sort of they do an ooh ah situation um, on sort of a, a multi-face call um, and then they all dig into their food which i think is a really fun and interesting way of of making sure that people are are engaged and um adding that that extra value it might be that you send some branded goods out you know but think about trying to link the physical and the virtual for your event 
your event timeline. So um, I think it's really important to make sure you've got enough time to set up your event. Um, make sure that as you go, you're constantly checking your goals. Why are you setting up? Are you still following those goals? Uh, when we set up a virtual event for a client, depending on the complexity, you know, if we're looking at the all bells and whistles, 3D rendered um, type of event, then we're going to ask for longer than if it's a web page based event. But the other thing that you've got to consider is, am I giving my delegates enough time to get it in their diary? Because if you're not, then the chances of you getting the numbers on your event that you want are going to be slim. So if I was in normal times, <laughs> so I'm going to chuck a caveat in there. In normal times, I would suggest giving um, four, six, eight weeks run up marketing wise to make sure that people attend your event. At the moment, I'm seeing much higher attendance on virtual events because not as many people are working. Um, people are not going out to, to conferences, they're not going out to meetings, so they tend to have a little more time in their diaries. So there's definitely a higher consumption. So I think that lead time has reduced, but I'd still give yourself two to three weeks to make sure that you can get the numbers right. Um, and last, but pretty much lastly of all, um, don't forget to be human on your virtual events. You know, we can, as a company can pre-record you know every single session that you do we can polish it we can edit it move all the herbs and r's um you know we can make sure that the backgrounds are perfect for your speakers you know i'm sitting in my daughter's bedroom at the moment on the floor with a white wall behind me um it can be as simple as that we can coach your speakers so that they're you know media ready we can advise you to send roller banners out to sit behind people if they're presenting on webcams you know, we can even do green screen or, you know, worst case scenario, you've got a white sheet hanging behind you. We can put a virtual backdrop on on that post production. Um, but certainly at the moment, people are accepting of the kids running in of um, of you, you know, sitting in front of um, the wine cooler of, you know, it doesn't have to be as polished. And actually, I think people are much more interactive when you are a bit human and there are some M's and R's, um, but pre-recording can make sure that you haven't got any swear words or any, anything that the speakers shouldn't have said. Um, so, you know, consider all your options there. You, you do have the luxury of pre-recording for a virtual event and broadcasting it out as if it were live. Um, so, you know, the fact that you don't have to run around and ensure all the speakers are ready at exactly the same time like you do for a live event, is a luxury I'd take hold of, <laughs> grab it with both hands. Okay, so that's me done in terms of some of the questions that I've answered uh, recently and uh, some of the advice that I've been giving my clients and over to, to question time if we've got any. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Caroline. I think you've certainly opened my eyes to what's possible with virtual events. Um, I've always been a fan of face to face events, but actually I, I didn't really realise that um, virtual events could be as in, engaging and interactive um, as you perhaps opened our eyes to. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in here. What um, what is um what's the engagement um ratio um compared to a face-to-face -face event obviously when people come to a face-to-face -face event they're quite often um pre-registered pre-assigned and you you know they're coming if it's an internal event you expect everyone to be there and they all come yeah what happens with a virtual event because obviously people are in their own time they're at home they can come and go as they please How, what what do you see of the differences um, so I guess there, there are two answers to this question. <laughs> There's the answer pre-COVID and the answer post-COVID or during COVID, should I say. Um, Pre-COVID, I would expect 30 to 40 percent from registration to attendance. Um, during COVID, I would expect closer to 50 percent or 60 percent, just because all the reasons that I've just mentioned. 
Um, in terms of the engagement, you're absolutely right. People can just stand up from their laptops and walk away. Um, you know, they've got different distractions at home. Um, the kids are downstairs or, um, you know, oh, there's something interesting on the TV over there or, you know, there's different styles of uh, different types of distractions. Um, so there are, you know, including our own um, platforms should be able to tell you um, to a certain degree how engaged people are. Um, how much of the session they've consumed, whether they switch tabs during the session. That's always a favorite because actually, you know, they might have played the sessions all the way through and been at the virtual conference all day, but they were really answering their emails. <laughs> they didn't even have their headphones in. So um, did they switch tabs? And, um, you know, the, the average engagement ratios t tends to be again about, about 50% um, of those who attend will actually consume the content. And that's why it's so important to get that content right, interesting. Is it interesting to you as a brand, as a, as a, um, as a business, or is it really helpful and interesting? Try and steer away from um, the hard sell on your virtual events because you're just gonna, you know, everybody's, <laughs> I guess, trying to sell via um, online at the moment. So um, think, think what's going to help people, what's going to support them um, and in, relate it, of course, to what you do, um, but try and go for um, the knowledge or um, valuable content and, like I said, different types of content to raise that engagement level. Brilliant, thank you. Um, if anybody does want to ask a question, do, um, uh, don't forget at the bottom where, where it says participants, you can just click the list of participants there and then you've got an option to raise hand um, and I'll come and unmute you. Um, we've got a question that's coming on um, <clears throat> the chat from Judy. If you want to crop in video uh, related to your event, do you recommend that the, uh, the speaker point to a new screen pop up or just cut into the main screen? Um, again, it's that's kind of like a, a design um, a choice, really. Um, if it's video content that you is related to the session, or if it's video content that is part of the session, um, then I'd suggest picture in picture if that makes sense, so you can still see the presenter, or you could have um, you know full screen of the video if you really want to make sure that everybody sees that content. You know, there's ways to, to close off all the rest of the content if you want one particular piece of content to be front and center. So it depends what that, the goal is for that actually, actually that bit of video, um, in my view. And that's an interesting point around um, content as well. Um, one of the um, questions I was curious about is when you go to a, a live event, you go for the day and then, and then you disappear off home and you might take a wad of paper or whatever it is you collected at the event. With a virtual event, do you um, see people still making content available kind of post event or can people, is, is the event only open from, you know, nine till five or do, is it sort of much, much freer than that? How, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, great question. So if there, there are ways that you can deliver it, you can basically deliver everything live. You can deliver everything pre-recorded, a mix of the two. Um, and depending on what you want to do afterwards so again relating it back to your goals if you want to make that make it evergreen content then yes absolutely make it on demand so people that couldn't make it in the first instance you've got a list of all of attendees non-attendees um you know even the list of of people that filled in the registration form all those people that didn't quite get to your content make sure you send them a link to the on demand and you're growing that and then you could potentially run the same event the following month and just reuse the content, um, perhaps rebadge it, reuse some of the content. Um, but I'd say, you know, keeping it on demand and keeping some potential call to actions, not all of them, because if they're not manned, so if you've got a question box or a chat widget that isn't actually manned, they're just gonna frustrate people. So switch those bits off um, during the on demand but give them the opportunity to email you or request a call back or request a demo or um, speak to an agent, Any, anything that um, you, know, you would typically um, supply uh, for, for clients in a, in a real event, consider afterwards um, what they can do when it's on demand. Um, and coming on to a point that you talked about earlier, which is um, 
when you you were talking about um, making sure that your platform's secure and having the the what if plan, the backup plan. What if something goes wrong or a speaker loses their Wi-Fi? What yeah. what what would you recommend? What what are what are the plan B options or what is the fail safe or what what happens if something does happen with technology and you are running a, a live event how what, what kind of things have you come across in the past and, and fixes or, or how do you make sure that that doesn't happen um if I'm totally honest with you there aren't many platforms out there that do have the backup plan <laughs> um you know I mean uh, um again without trying to plug streamco the way that we handle it is we've got um a producer managing your stream so if i don't know um the the main servers in the world went down then we'd still have a backup server we'd also have a backup several backup servers actually there's about seven that are launched at the beginning of your event um, so we've got lots of fail safes if any of them go down and the viewers will never even notice that you know the server's gone down the event you might they might get a black screen for all of um, 0.3 of a second or something like that um, the backup CDN so content delivery networks are huge um, and even you know you you'll potentially watch the BBC I don't know think of it, a news channel it's sometimes sometimes the BBC will go down and they'll give you oops sorry we've got a technical issue screen um, but they're back up very very quickly and that's because of the way that their content is um, delivered so it's delivered in little packets without getting too technical it's delivered in little packets of content so that if there is a technical issue they can go back a packet and it's just a tiny bit of content um, so that there's not much missed if any um, so it's the way that we deliver things it's the same as a, a television broadcast um, and equally because you've got a, um, a producer sitting there on the event they can talk to the audience um, they can still show slides and then the presenter can call in on a phone if they lose wi-fi so they can click through the slides for them there's lots of different ways that um, that can be done um, with sort of with free tools as well but it's just making sure you've got a backup option um, especially at the moment um, online meeting tools wi-fi <laughs> everything's a little overloaded at home so more more now than ever i would suggest you've got you've got backup yeah i, I think it's it's a really interesting point and something that i think clients would always be really concerned about um, if they are asking people to invest their time in coming to their event they want to be sure that the event can actually take place and just like going to a hotel or venue you make sure that you know it's all up and running that everything is in place and, and working um, and I guess it's the same with um, you know, having a virtual platform so it's really reassuring to hear that um, you know people like yourself such as StreamGo have considered all of those options because I know there's a lot of um, sort of free platforms and you know we're, we're on Zoom today which has you know, really taken off since COVID-19 um, but again a lot of some of these platforms do have their own their own challenges um, so it's yeah. good as event planners for us to know that if, if there is going to be a move towards um, more virtual events in the future which there is every chance that some you know some events will will continue down that, that route and um, that there are secure and robust um, platforms um, to be able to support that. Um, yeah, talking about the security, I think, you know, our platform, we can whitelist, blacklist, um, we can add unique passcodes onto every event or every session. Um, you can physically remove people from the delegate list. Um, you know, you can't really chuck a competitor out if they come to your physical event, it's awkward, but um, you can on a virtual event. Um, so think about the security of your event if that indeed, you know, if you're delivering something that you don't want your competitors to get a hold of, or you have, you're an event producer and you've got a client that's got, you know, top secret um, information on their event, I would strongly suggest that you don't use an open source or free tool. Right. Um, got a question from Claire. Um, what do you mean by call to action? I think this. Oh, was sorry. A couple of yeah. questions ago, you were. Um, yeah, we talked about that. <laughs> Um, so a call to action can be a, a request. So it tends in, in web speak, it tends to be a button um, on a web page. Um, so, you know, a, on an e-commerce website, a, a website that sells products, um, you know, your add to cart button is your call to action on that page. Um, in a virtual event, it's a button and it doesn't have to be a button, but it tends to be a button. Um, 
it will be a button that says um, request a demo, speak to an expert, um, request a call back to, to name a few, but um, it's just a, just another word for a, for a button. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're going to wrap up fairly soon because um, as you mentioned earlier, the um, average attention span is 59 <laughs> minutes and I think we're on 42. So I think we've done well, uh, really well to hold everybody for those extra few minutes. So I I'm think, saying, everyone. <laughs> yeah, if, if, so if, you, if there are any more questions, please do raise your hand or just drop it into the chat. Um, I think what, what's interesting to know is that um, it's, what is the percentage of, uh, you may not even know this, but do you know the percentage of um, events that are run virtually compared to face-to-face? -to -face? Um, and have you seen um, since COVID-19 that there is sort of more traction um, in virtual events? Yes, <laughs> um, I definitely know the answer to the latter. Um, <laughs> the, the figure is changing um, rapidly every hour. Um, I would suggest it, you know, virtual events were still pretty new in the UK, um, fairly common in the US, um, becoming more common in the UK um, over the last couple of years. But I would say they still only take up about probably 15% of event market until COVID-19. And now, whew, um, <laughs> in the current time, 100% of the market. So, yeah. It, it's a very diff different time that we're experiencing. But like you mentioned before, I genuinely think there will be more of a shift to virtual events um, as people are more conscious about their travel spend, their carbon footprint, their, you know, um, the, the value add of traveling to go to, to every event on the, the calendar list. Um, and when we do get back to normal, which we will, um, I think it'll, it'll probably be a hybrid of the two. So people will be, you know, expect the opportunity to see their events online. So giving somebody the opportunity to attend live and online is where the real value will be, I believe, in the future. Brilliant. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> but I believe. Brilliant. Thank you very, very, very much. I think lots of people have probably got another um, call to go to. So thank you um, so much. Um, what we will try and do is um, get hold of some of these um, slides perhaps and see if we can share some content with you um, all afterwards. We've, um, you've all pre-registered for this event, so we've got your email. So um, we will try and share that with you um, through email, but um, do come and join um, some of our next events. They're, they're all listed on the Eventbrite page where you registered for this event. Um, and we've got some great things coming up over the next few weeks, but, Yes, let's, um, let's see where the virtual event world takes us in, um, in the months to come. And I hope everybody stays safe and that you really enjoyed today's session. Thank you very much for coming and participating. And thank you to Caroline from StreamGo. Thank you, everyone. Thanks thank for your you. time. Thanks. Bye.